I'm a Catholic. I believe uh, Brother Yusuf was a Catholic before. I would like to ask him the simple question. He was brought up like a Catholic, but what made him change? Doesn't he believe that the Messiah is true, or did he ever feel that the uh, religion, Catholic religion, has not brought up any Messiah and the Bible is false? I would like to just know what that means because he said he was a Catholic before and now he has become a Muslim. What made you change? What was that storyline before? Doesn't he believe that there is a Messiah or the Messiah had come, saved us, died on the cross? Thank you very much for a good question. I hate to disappoint you, but I wasn't a Catholic. But I was with a Catholic priest the night that he accepted Islam. And I asked him these questions you asked me. Because after all, I was still a Christian, a preacher in Christianity, and I wanted to know why my best friend, a Catholic priest, had converted. That's a pretty weird thing. A Catholic priest is not like a regular preacher in the Protestant religion. A Catholic priest has given up his, given up everything. He's given up his life to be a Catholic priest. When he enters into this realm, he's basically given away everything. He can't have a wife, he can't have children, obviously no grandchildren. He has no home, he just lives in a rectory or wherever they give him a place to stay. And he's sent wherever they tell him to go, do whatever he's told to do, and that's it. And he cannot disobey the Pope, otherwise they can kick him out of the religion. And if they do, he's excommunicated and he goes to hell forever. So how would a person like this want to become one of those Muslim terrorists? That's what I wanted to know. He explained in a very few beautiful words something that I came to learn for myself. He said that he was sincerely in the Catholic religion because he believed in God. That he had studied, his degree was in theology, and a part of the teaching that they as priests have is to study Islam. Every priest is forced to study Islam. Now you may not know that, but you can ask your priest and he'll confirm it. And when you study Islam, even when Islam is taught to you by somebody who hates Islam, as long as they don't corrupt it too far, you can still see the truth in Islam. A classical example happened to me just recently when I was in Saudi Arabia. A friend of mine, very old copy, of one of the first Qurans ever translated to English by George Sale. George Sale hated Islam, he hated the Muslims, but when he translated the Quran to English, he was true, he was true to the text of the words. Although maybe not getting all the meaning, he certainly was true to the text of the words. I was shocked when I read it. Have you seen it? You know what I'm talking about? Amazing. And listen to this, George Bernard Shaw, for instance, is one of many, a long list of people who read this and realized the truth of Islam. When people see the truth of Islam, it can change them if they want to be guided. If they want the truth, it can change them. You might think, I'm a Catholic, I'll never be anything but a Catholic. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. This is not for you to, you know, start a debate, but just be honest. Was Jesus a Catholic? And it's not open to debate, so there's no point in opening that up because you know and I know he wasn't. The Catholic Church was in business about 300 years before Jesus was born. It's on their website. Don't go like this. It's on their website. That's where I took it from. The Catholic Church was really started in Rome by Alexander the Great. Do you know what the word Catholic means? It means universal. It was the universal church for the Roman Empire. If you didn't join it, you could not be a Roman citizen. And it was opposed to the teachings of Judaism and opposed to the teachings of the early Christians for more than 200 and some years. And they were diametrically opposed to each other to the extent that it was the Romans killing the early Christians. Now, if you understand that and you go to their website and read, they didn't even take over Christianity until the year 325 AD. 
And when they did, they changed a lot of things. Again, referring to their own website. But if you want to check it in Britannica or Americana or grow your encyclopedias, go ahead and read about the Catholic Church. When in August of 325 AD at the Nicaea Council, they took over. First thing they said was, let's change the date of the birth of Jesus to be the same date as that of Mithras, which was the God, one of the gods worshipped there, and also the sun god's birthday was the same day, December the 25th, believing it to be the shortest day of the year. And Constantine was a sun worshipper of Saul Invictus. Go to the website, read it for yourself. There are a lot of points, but not the least of which, even today, if you go in any Catholic church, and I have, you'll see so many portraits and statues and idols and images throughout the whole place. That for the one who's never experienced that, for a Muslim who knows about these images, he'll be like, whoa, how was it below? Whoa, what's this? The first time I walked in a Catholic church, I was about 10 years old. I was shocked. I was shocked at the idols and statues everywhere because in the Protestant religion, we were brought up to believe that the second commandment was just as important as, as the first commandment. The first commandment in the Bible in Exodus is the same as the first commandment in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt in the house of bondage. You know no other God beside me. Beside me there's no other gods. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. How many in this room agree with that commandment? Raise your hand. You notice the Muslims are raising their hand because it means Shadu la ilaha illallah. That's the first commandment for us as well. The second commandment you have clearly says thou shalt now make any idol, any graven image of anything that creeps upon the earth, swims in the sea beneath or flies in the air above. And I was sitting in a church one time, sitting there in the morning service, watching, you know, the preacher talk. And, you know, they go on and on and on. And sometimes you lose your train of thought. I was looking. Whoa! On the front of the podium, there was a fish. A fish. For the symbol, make you fishers of men. They had a fish. I said, whoa! Then I looked up above his head at the big stained glass window and it had a dove and he had the, the olive branch in his mouth. The dove is flying, the bird, you know? I said, whoa. And then I look over here and there's a cross with a man hanging on it. And I said, wow, they didn't miss a single one. They got them all. Something walking on the earth, something swimming in the sea beneath, something flying in the air above. So look at these two things. Clearly the first two of the Ten Commandments, bang, bang, boom. Because if you said God is more than one, where did you get it from? When Jesus is talking to his own companions and they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? Mark 12, 29. Clear. The greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And this is no different from what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is saying the same thing to his people. Same thing I mentioned in the lecture. This is certainly for us the same. So what you see is Muslims practicing the commandments and you see people claiming the commandments, but practicing something else. And I, I have seen more converts from the Catholic Church than any other of the many sects of Christianity. And especially from the nuns, priests, and even an archbishop.